I have a hard time concentrating and sorting the next day. Sundays are for work. There are no leisure activities, so I likely won't see Kai until Monday. I can't talk to him about his story until then. I can't say I'm sorry about your parents. I say those words before when I first came to live with the Markinghams, and we all welcomed him and expressed our condolences. But it's different now. That I really know what happened, because before I knew they died, but I didn't know how. I didn't know that he saw the, it rain down from the sky while he watched helpless. Burning the napkin with the part of his story on it is one of the hardest things I've ever done. Like the books out at the restoration site, like grandfather's poem, Kai's story, a bit by bit, is turning into ash and nothing. Except he remembered it, and now I do too. A message from Nora appears on my screen, interrupting my sort. Please report to the supervisor station. I lift my head and look across the sorting slots towards Nora, and then I stand straight up in, in surprise. The officials are back for me. They watch me as I walk along the aisles of other workers, and I think I can see approval in their eyes. I feel relieved. Congratulations, the gray-haired official tells me when I reach them. You scored very well on your test. Thank you, I say, as I always do to the officials. But this time I mean it. The next step is a real life sort. The officials tell me, at some point in your near future, we will come and escort you to the site of the test. I nod and I had, I heard about this too. They'll take you to a sort, something real, actual data, like news or actual people or a small subset of a school class to see if you can apply things in the real world. If you can, you move on to the next step, which is likely your final work position. This is happening quickly and fast. In fact, everything seems hurried lately. The hasty removal of the artifacts from personal residences, my mother's sudden trip, and now this, more and more of us leaving school earlier in the year. The officials wait for me to respond. Thank you, I said. In the afternoon, my mother receives a message at work. Go home and pack. She's needed for another trip. It may be even longer than the last one. I could tell by my father didn't like this. And neither does Bram. Neither do I, as a matter of fact. I sit at the bed and watch her as she packs. She folds two extra pairs of plain clothes and folds her pajamas, underclothes, socks. She opens her tablet container and checks the tablets. She's missing one, the green tablet. She glances at me and I look away. It makes me think that perhaps these trips are harder than I, they seemed. I realize that in seeing the missing tablet, I haven't seen an example of her weakness, but an example of her strength. What she's dealing with is difficult enough to make her take the green tablet, so it must be also be difficult to keep inside. Not to share it with us, but she is strong and she keeps the secret because it protects us. Kasia, Molly, my father, walks into the room and I stand up to leave. I move quickly over to my mother to embrace her. When I step back, her eyes meet and I smile at her. I want her to know that I know that I shouldn't have to look away earlier. I'm not ashamed of her. I know how hard it is to keep secrets. I may be a sorter like my father but my grand and my grandfather before me, but I also am my mother's daughter. On Monday morning, Kai and I walk into the trees and find the spot where we stopped the time before. We start make marking again with red flags. I wish it were so easy to begin where we left off in other ways. At first, I hesitate, not wanting to disturb the peace of the woods, 
with the horror of the outer providences. But he has suffered so long alone, I can't bear to make him wait one more minute. Kai, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry they are gone. He doesn't say anything, but bends and ties a red cloth around the particularly thorny shrub. He shakes a bit, and I know what a brief moment of losing control means for someone like Kai. I want to comfort him. Place my hand on his back gently, softly, just enough so he knows that I am there. As my hands meet the cloth of his shirt, he spins around and pulls back. And when I see the pain in his eyes, his look begs me not to say any more. It is enough that I know. It may be too much. Who's syphilis? I asked, trying to think of something to distract him. You mentioned the name once when the officer told us we were going to start climbing the hill. Someone whose story has been told for a long time. Kai stands up and starts walking again. I can tell that he needs to keep moving today. It was one of my father's favorite stories to tell. I think he wanted to be Cypheris because Cypheris was crappy and sneaky and always causing trouble for the society and officials. Kai never talked about his father before. Kai's voice sounded flat. I can't tell from his tone how he feels about the man who died years ago, the man who named Kai and held his hand in the picture. Those, there's a story about how Cypress once asked an official to show him how a weapon worked and then he turned it on the official. I must have looked shocked because Kai seemed to have anticipated my surprise. His eyes are kind, and he explains, it's an old story from back when officials carried weapons. They don't use them anymore. And then what he doesn't say is what we both know is that they don't have to. The threat of reclassification is enough to keep almost everyone in line. Kai turns back and pushes his way ahead. I watch him more and the muscles on his back inch away from me. I follow closer so then I slip through the branches he holds back for me. The smell of the forest seems for a moment to simply be smell of him. I wonder what stage smells like. I smell the smell he says is his favorite in his old life. I hope that the smell of this forest is his favorite now. I know it is mine. The society decide that they need to keep Cyphers a punishment, a special one, because he dared to think that he could be as clever as one of them when he wasn't an official or even a citizen. He was nothing. He was an aberration from the outer providence. What did they do to him? They gave him a job. He had a roll, a rock, a huge one to the top of a mountain. That doesn't sound so terrible. There's relief in my voice. If the story ended well, then Cyprus maybe it can end well for Kai. That it wasn't as easy as it sounds. He was about to reach the top and the rock would roll back to the bottom. He had to start again. It happened every time. He never got the rock to the top. He went on pushing forever. I see, I say, realizing why a hikes on the little hill remind Kai of Cyphers. Day after day, we w did the same thing, climbing back up and climbing back down. But we did make it to the top of the little hill. We were never allowed to stay there for long, Kai points out. He was from your providence. I stopped for a moment, thinking I've heard the off officials whistle, but it was merely a shrill bird call from the canopy of leaves above us. I don't know. I don't know if he's real, Kai says, if he ever existed. Then why tell his story? I don't understand. For a second, I feel betrayed. Why did Kai tell me about this person and make me feel complete empathy for him? 
if there's no proof that he even lived at all. Kai pauses for a moment before he answers. His eyes wide and deep like the ocean in the tails or like the sky in the, my own. Even if he didn't live, the story enough of us have lived life just like it. So it's true anyways. I think about what Kaya said Well, we move again, quickly try, trying off areas and helping each other around through tangled parts of the forest. There's a smell here that I have smelled before, a smell of decay that doesn't seem rotten. It seems almost rich. A scent of plants returning to the earth and woods giving away to dust. But the hill could be hiding something. I reminds Kai words and pictures and I realize that no place is completely good. No place is completely bad. But I've been thinking in terms of absolutes. First, I believed our society was perfect. The night that came for the artifacts, I believed they were evil. Now I simply don't know. Kai blurs the lines for me. He helps me see clearly, too. And I hope I do the same for him. Why do you throw the games? I ask him. As we pause in a small clearing, his face tightens. I have to. Every time? Don't you even let yourself think about winning? I always think about winning, Kai tells me. There is fire in his eyes again. He snaps a branch off the tree to make room for us to go through. He tosses the first branch to the side and holds another one back, waiting for me to pass. But I stay right there next to him. He looks down at me, shadow, from the leaves crossing his face, and also sun. He looks at my lips, watching makes it hard to speak, even though I know what I want to say. Alexander knows you lose on purpose. He knows, I know he does. Kai smiles and says, Kai says and a smile tugs the corner of his mouth. Like the one I thought I saw last night. Any other questions? Just one, I say. What color are your eyes? I want to know what he thinks, how he sees himself, the real Kai, when he dares to look. Blue, he says, sounding surprised. They've always been blue, not me. What do they look like to you, he says, puzzled, amused. Not looking at my mouth anymore, looking into my eyes. Lots of colors, I say. At first I thought they were brown. Once I thought they were green. Another time I thought they were gray. They are most often blue, though. What are they now, he asks. His widen his eyes a little, lean closer, lets me look as long and deep as I want. And there is so much to see. They are blue and black, the other colors too. I know some of what they've seen and what I hope that they will see now. Me, Kasia, I want to feel who I am. Well, Kayas, everything, I tell them, they're everything. Neither of us moves for a moment, locked instead in each other's eyes in the branches of the hills we might never finish climbing. I'm the one who moves first. I step past him and push my way through some more tangled leaves and climb over a small fallen tree. Behind me I hear Kai doing the same. I'm falling in love. I'm falling in love. And it's not with Xander, although I do love him. I'm sure of that. I'm sure I am of the fact that I feel for Kai is something different. As I tie another red flag on the trees, I wish for the falling of the society and the systems, including the matching system, so that I can be with Kai. I realize that it is a selfish wish, even if the fact that the society would make life better for some, it would make it worse for others. Who am I to try and change things, to get greedy and want more? If our society changes, the things are different. Who am I to tell the girl who would have enjoyed the safe protection of a life that now she has to have the choice and the danger because of me? The answer is, I am 
I'm not anyone. I'm just one of the people who happened to fall in the majority. All my life, the odds have been on my side. Kasia, Kai says. He snaps another branch off and bends it down in swift movement to write in a thick dirt on the fourth floor. He has to push away the layers of leaves and spiders hurry away. Look, he says, showing me another letter, K. Thankful for the distraction, I crouch down beside him. This letter is more difficult and it takes several tries to come even close. In spite of my practice, with other letters, my hand is still not used to this, to writing in this way, but taking, tapping, when I finally get it right and look up, I see Kai grinning at me, so I've learned K, I say grinning back. That's strange, though. I thought we'd be going alphabetically. We were, Kai says, tell, Kai says, but I think K is a good letter to know. What's my next letter then? I ask in a mocking innocence. Could it be Y? It could, Kai agrees. He is no longer smiling, but his eyes are mischievous. A whistle sounds behind and below us. Hearing it, I wonder how I could have ever thought that, could, that the bird call I heard earlier sounded anything like the officer's whistle. One of the sounds metallic and man-made, the other sounds high and clear and lovely. I sigh and brush my hand across the dirt, returning the letters to the earth. Then we reach the rock and make the crane. Kai does the same. Together we build a tower piece by piece by piece. When I put the last rock on top of the pile, Kai puts his hand over mine. I do not pull away. I do not want anything to fall, and I like the feeling of his rough, warm hand on top of mine, with the cool, smooth surface of the rock underneath. Then I turn my hand slowly and put my palm in up our fingertips intertwined. I can never be matched, he says, looking first at his hand and then into my eyes. I'm an aberration. He wants, he waits for my reaction. But you're not an anomaly, I say, trying to make light of things, knowing immediately that it was a mistake. There's nothing light about this. Not yet, anyways, he says, but the humor in his voice sounds forced. It is one of the things to make a choice. It's another thing to have not have a chance. I feel a sharp, cold loneliness deep within me. What would it be like to be so alone, to know that you could never choose anything else? That's when I realized that the statistics the officials give us do not matter to me. I know there are many people who are happy, and I'm glad for them. But this is Kai. If he is the one person who falls by the wayside while the other 99 are happy and fulfilled, that is not right. To, with me anymore. I realize that I don't care about the officers pacing below or the other hikers among the trees or really anything else. That it is when I realize how dangerous this truly is. But if we, we you, you were matched, I say softly, what do you think she'd be like? You, he says almost before I finish, you. We do not kiss. We do do nothing but hold hands and breathe. But still, I know I cannot go gently now. Not even if the sake of my parents and family. Not even for Alexander.